Okay, so um, today I want to move on so to chapter three in your handbooks, uh, which is where we start to look at multi-component distillation. Okay, so we'll be building on what a lot of you did last year and looking at how we can think about distillation when we've got potentially a lot more than two components. So I'll start off essentially with just a quick reminder for you of vapor liquid equilibria, just so you remember what's important for this topic. And then we'll move on to thinking about how we can look at this multi-component distillation. And I'll introduce to you what's called the shortcut design method. And then after that we'll have some thoughts and sort of considerations about what are the important things that we need to think about when we're actually designing distillation columns. Okay? So hopefully you should remember that if we've got uh, a multi-component mixture, that if that mixture is in equilibrium, then the fugacity of all of the components, so the fugacity in the vapor phase of each component and the fugacity in the liquid phase of each component must be equal. Okay, that's the definition of equilibrium. So we can typically define the fugacities in terms of a fugacity coefficient, the composition of each component, and the total pressure. We can do that for the vapor and the liquid phase. While we typically do that for the vapor phase, for the liquid phase, we actually often define it instead in terms of an activity coefficient and the saturated vapor pressure of that component. Okay? So combining those two definitions for the fugacity of the vapor and the fugacity of the liquid phase, we essentially come to this equation here, which must be true for any system, any vapor liquid system in equilibria. And then what we often do is rearrange this in terms of a K, which essentially is the ratio of the fraction of component I in the vapor phase to the fraction of component I in the liquid phase. Okay? And that gives us our K value in terms of our activity coefficient, our fugacity coefficient, the saturated vapor pressure, and the total pressure of our system. For any sort of moderate pressures within our system, generally less than about 8 bar, then normally what you find is the fugacity coefficient is approximately equal to 1. So for most systems that we're interested in, we can actually assume that's the case and remove that from our expression for K. And if we're assuming an ideal system, then we can also say that our activity coefficient is equal to 1. So we can very easily and quickly simplify our K value just to be the ratio of our saturated vapor pressure to the total pressure of the system. Okay? So typically, for distillation, we can define what's called the relative volatility. The relative volatility is the ratio between the K value of one component and the K value of a second component. Often, our second component we call the reference component, and all the other components in our system we compare the K values to. So we get a relative volatility for all of our components in the system compared to one reference component. Okay? And the relative volatility of the reference component is equal to 1. Now, in a distillation column, 
because the saturated vapor pressure is actually dependent on the temperature, and the temperature inside the distillation column actually varies, yep, so the bottom is hotter than the top, then what you actually get is you actually get a different value of relative volatility on every stage inside your distillation column. So what we tend to do for ease is to actually, we can define an average relative volatility and we define a geometric mean and you can actually do this for as many stages as you want. So you take the relative volatilities for stages you know. Typically you know the relative volatility of a top stage because you've specified your top product and typically you know the relative volatility of the bottom stage because you've specified your bottom product. So they're the two easiest ones to calculate. They also tend to be the two that are the most different because they're the most different composition-wise. And you can define an average relative volatility based on taking a geometric mean of those two known relative volatilities. Okay, and we'll, you'll see how we use this value later on. So a quick recap from the first lecture. <clears throat> so if you remember, I commented that in the distillation column, the components we're separating, the key components that we're actually undertaking the separation on are the key. So in this case, we're separating B from D. So we've defined them as the key components. It's typical that we write our components in order of relative volatility. So highest relative volatility at the top, lowest relative volatility at the bottom. Therefore, lowest boiling point component at the top highest boiling point component at the bottom. And our key component that has the highest relative volatility or the lowest boiling point is defined as the light key. And our key component that has the lowest relative volatility or the highest boiling point we define as our heavy key. Okay? So in this case, because we're separating B from D, we know that the majority of B goes to the top of our column. We also know that the majority of A must go to the top of our column because it has a higher vapor pressure than B. We know the majority of D goes to the bottom of our column. And then what we also have in this system is we have component C, which is classed as an intermediate boiling component because it has a relative volatility between B and D. And our component C, therefore, splits partly between the top of the column and partly to the bottom of the column. Okay? And then the shortcut method, which we're going to go on to see, actually allows you to quantify how these separations are in our distillation column. So for binary distillation, which you should already be familiar with, there's a, there's a number of methods where you can actually use to design your distillation column for binary methods. So you should have all done the mccabe peel method, where you have the equilibrium curve and you have your operating lines, and then you step between your operating lines. Some of you may have looked at the, the ponchon severet method, which is a slight variation on the mccabe teal method. And in this case, you have the enthalpies, the enthalpies of your vapor and the enthalpies of your liquid. And very similar to the Hunter-Nash method for liquid-liquid extraction, you actually have operating points, and you step between the operating points and the equilibrium tie lines for your system. And also, for a two-component system, you could, if you wanted, do a stage-by-stage -stage rigorous calculation where you perform a mass and energy balance on every single tray. 
Okay? And that's, the set, that's what HiSys does when you put a rigorous column in HiSys. That's what HiSys is doing. It's calculating a mass and energy balance for every tray in the column. So when we've got more components in our system, um, then actually that's a lot more difficult. We can't use the McCabe-Till method. We can't use the ponchel savray method. We can use the rigorous method. However, if we were trying to do this, it would take a very long time. So we actually want to be able to find a method first to actually approximately design our columns. The other thing with multi-component distillation is because we now have lots of components, we define two components which are the key components for our separation. However, all the other components in the system just actually separate based on their relative volatility in the system. So we don't actually have direct control over how the other components in our system separate. So we can specify our two key components, but then the other components in our system will just separate how they want to separate based on their relative volatility. So we need to understand how we can look at those separations. And the selection of those key components is essentially an engineering decision. So that's one of the decisions that we have to make as a chemical engineer. We're the ones that have to look at this multi-component system and define what our key components are based on our needs for our process plant. So there's a number of different shortcut methods. And what these methods do is they actually build to form a process where we can actually look at our column and actually design our whole column through to calculate things like the reflux ratio, the number of stages we need, the feed tray location, so everything we need to get an approximate design for our column. And these shortcut methods are actually based on two different concepts. Some of them are based on a simplified theoretical analysis of a distillation column. So we think about a more simplified distillation column and actually produce an analytical or theoretical equation. And some of them are based on <coughs> empirical data. So someone has gone out, they've collected a large variety of data from real distillation columns, and they've correlated that to allow us to predict what typically happens in distillation columns. Okay? And using all of these tools together allows us to design our whole distillation column. So the process is a multi-step process. So when we, first of all, we need to do what we actually want to do for any separation, which is start to actually define what our products want to be. So we want to think about our top product. So we can specify our top product phase. So do we need a vapor or a liquid for that top product phase? Okay. Later on today, we'll think about some considerations around that decision, why we might want a vapor or a liquid as a top product. But essentially, if we want a vapor, we want to think about having a partial condenser. And if we want a liquid top product, we need to think about having a total condenser for our distillation column. We then want to actually think about the separation we want. So we've got to define our light and our heavy key components. Okay, so we need to look at our system, think about what we actually need to separate in our system, and define those components. The third step is when we know those components, we actually, want to, we actually need to specify the mole fraction of those components in the bottom and the distillate. Generally, we would do a light key in the bottoms and a heavy key in the distillate. 
So what you're looking at there is how much of your light key you can waste by letting it go to the bottom of the column and how much of your heavy key you can waste or you can contaminate your product by letting it go to the top of the column. Okay? So again, that's on us to decide that and that might be specified through a product purity that you need if you're making your final product or it might be specified on how much contaminant you can have going into your reactor if this is to clean up your feed to a reactor. Okay? And then the fourth option is to specify the pressure of the condenser and the reboiler. So by specifying the pressure of the column, what we actually therefore define is the temperature that our column runs at because the pressure is linked to the temperature through our vapor liquid equilibria in the column. And also by specifying the pressure, we do actually specify that equilibria between the components. Okay? So we can vary the equilibria a bit by changing the pressure in our system. So these first four stages essentially go to specifying the separation that's actually happening in the column. Okay. okay? So when we've got the specifications for our column, what we can actually do is start to undertake calculations for our shortcut method to actually design the column. So we've specified our top product, we've specified our bottom product, and we know the feed. Okay? So what we can do is we can now calculate the relative volatilities of our top product and our bottom product, and if we want, we can also calculate the relative volatility of the feed. Okay? Now with the knowledge of those relative volatilities, what we can do is as I just mentioned, which is calculate the average relative volatility by taking the geometric mean of those values. So if we were actually to take these three, the top, the bottom, and the feed point, what we would do is we'd take the relative volatility of the top times by the relative volatility of the bottom times by the relative volatility of the, of the feed and then cube root that answer and that would give us our average relative volatility. When we've got that average relative volatility, then we can start to use our shortcut equations. The first one that we'll use is the Fensky equation that will calculate our n min value, our minimum number of stages needed for that potential separation. Then after we've calculated this, we can estimate the split of our non-key components using the hengensek beck gedez method. Anyone can correct me on that name, by the way, I say it differently, I think, every single time. Um, after we've specified our non-key component splits, then essentially what we have to do is repeat 5, 6, and 7 until our value of n min doesn't change. The reason that we do that is because our relative volatility of the top and the bottom product is actually dependent on the split of our non-key components. So we actually form an iterative loop to actually make sure that the relative volatilities are as accurate as possible for all our components. When we've done this and we've got a steady value of n min, we can move and plug this value, we can use our values then in the Underwood equations to calculate our R min. And then that gives us essentially an N min and an R min. So we can define essentially an actual reflux ratio that we want to use that you might remember from previously, we would start with an estimation of something like 1.1 or 1.2 times the minimum reflux ratio. When, we, when we've picked our actual reflux ratio we want to use, 
then we can use what's called the Gillen correlation to calculate the actual number of stages. And when we have our actual number of stages, we can calculate essentially the position of the feed using the Kirkbride equation. Okay, so I've mentioned a few key equations in that series of lists, but we're going to go on to just have a look at what those equations are. But every time you need to use the shortcut method, you essentially work through these 12 steps. And that allows you to get the design for your distillation column. So the first key equation that I mentioned was the Fenske equation. So the Fenske equation allows you to estimate the minimum number of theoretical stages in our column. Okay? So the Fenske equation is one of the equations that I mentioned is actually based on a simplified theoretical approach. Okay? So for the Fenske equation, what we do is we take our distillation column and we make the assumption that there's total reflux within that column. Okay? Total reflux essentially means there is no product, so it's a pretty useless distillation column. However, it's a nice simplification of our column to allow us to do calculations. So we make the assumption of total reflux. We also make the assumption that the relative volatility in the total column is constant. Okay? And that's one of the reasons we use that average relative volatility that we calculate. Because we need to make the assumption that the relative volatility doesn't change in our column. If we do that, we essentially produce the following equation where we can work out the minimum number of stages based on knowledge of the, comp the diffraction of our light and heavy key in our distillate and our, and our heavy and light key in our bottom product and also knowledge of that average relative volatility. Okay? So I'm not going to go through the full derivation of that equation it's in your handbook. Okay? Uh, the good news is I, will ask you, I may ask you to use the Fenske equation in the exam, but I'm not going to ask you to derive it in the exam. You'll see if you look in the handbook, I think it's probably about two pages long, the derivation. But it's useful to have a look to understand where it comes from. Yeah. Can you give it? Yes. <laughs> yeah, um, I'll also give you the Fenske equation. <laughs> yeah. Um, in fact, this is a good point to mention that, um, just because you've reminded me, on Blackboard you can actually see the, the page, which is the, uh, the list of formula given in the exam, is actually on Blackboard, so you can see what formulas you will be given. Okay, so from, the, from this equation here, so just from knowledge of the composition of your light and heavy keys that you've actually specified, in your top and bottom product and the calculation of that average relative volatility in the column, you can actually calculate the minimum number of stages needed to achieve that separation. <coughs> so the next was the hengst beck gadez method and what this does is it allows you to specify the composition of your non-key components. Now, this method here is actually a rearrangement of the Fenske equation. And all it is, it's a rearrangement that basically says that if you plot the log of the relative volatility of each component against the log of the amount in the distillate over the amount in the bottom product of each component, you should get a straight line. Okay? So you'll get a straight line between these two. You define your light, uh, your light key and your heavy key, which we already know and have specified. So then what you can do is for all your other components, 
If you know their average relative volatility, you can simply find their average relative volatility, go up to the, to the line, and then read across how they split between the top and the bottom product in the distillation column. Okay? So we can actually compare how we think a total reflux approximation of a distillation column, how this split of components would actually compare to a real life column. Okay? So the first thing we can think about actually is the uh, is basically the uh, the opposite uh, total reflux, which is minimum reflux. So it's the minimum reflux needed just to achieve our separation. So what we get with our minimum reflux is we essentially get a similarish trend between our light and heavy key components, albeit slightly curved but any component heavier than the heavy key or lighter than the light key essentially doesn't get split between the streams. So any component lighter than the light key automatically goes to the top of the column and any component heavier than the heavy key automatically goes to the bottom of the column. Okay. But this doesn't actually give us, so, so this is our two extremes, but what we need to do is, well, why did we decide that the uh, taking a total reflux is the best approximation for how the components actually separate in the column? Okay, so what we can do is essentially look at two actual realistic reflux ratios rather than an infinite or a minimum reflux ratio. Yep. So, if we take a very high reflux ratio, five times the R min, we would never normally go to five times the R min, but in this case we can use it as a realistic but very high approximation. We can also take a very low reflux ratio, something like 1.1 times R min. Okay. And if we actually plot the actual distribution of components for these, uh, for these reflux ratios on our graph, we can actually see that the, the estimation for the total reflux line is that actually falls in between these two realistic or potential reflux ratios. Yep. So that's giving us some sort of confidence that making this total reflux ratio simplica simplification at least is going to give us an approximation of something like what's actually happening in our distillation column. Okay? So the third one of our equations is the Underwood equation. So the Underwood equation is also a theoretical analysis. <clears throat> and if you remember back to when you were looking at two component distillation and thinking about how you calculate the minimum reflux ratio for two component distillation, what you did was you actually defined that as where this operating line and the feed line met at the equilibrium curve, yep, because that produces a pinch point on our system, and when you start to step down for your trays, you can't move past that pinch point, okay? So the Underwood equation is essentially an extension of this analysis, but in more dimensions, because we've got more components, okay? It's a two-part equation. So what you do is with knowledge of your, um, your relative volatilities of each component and your feed composition of each component and knowledge of Q, which is the feed quality, okay? what you do is you solve this equation 
for this value of thy, and then when you know this value of thy, you can plug it in to the second part of the equation, where you use that with, again, the relative volatilities and the composition that you've defined for your distillate product. Okay, and that allows you to find your R min value. Okay, again, the full derivation is in your handbook, so I would encourage you to have a look at that. But just like the Fensky equation, I won't ask you to have to derive it in the exam, but I may ask you to use the Underwood equation. Okay? So we now move on to some equations which are now actually of the, the correlative kind. Okay? So the Fensky, the Hegens-Gadez method, and the Underwood equation were all based on a simplified theoretical analysis of the column. But now we're starting to, now we've got our minimum values, so we've got our minimum reflux ratio, and we've got our minimum number of stages. Now as we're trying to move to calculate the actual number of stages from the actual reflux ratio, we move into methods that are actually based on correlating lots of data taken from real distillation columns in use. Okay? So there's two key methods that people use. The first is the Gilliland correlation. The, uh, the advantage of the Gilliland correlation is it's essentially a single equation. So this black line is an, is an equation and it links essentially a ratio set of our reflux ratios to that of our number of trays in the column. Okay? And the points here are the actual real experimental distillation columns on the system. There's an alternative to the Gilliland correlation, which is the Ebar Maddox correlation, okay? which is slightly more complicated in the fact that what you have to do is you pick a line based on your minimum reflux ratio, and then you pick a coordinate based on the actual reflux ratio you want, and then you read off your ratio of the minimum number of stages to the actual number of stages. Okay? The Ebon Maddox correlation is actually more accurate than the Gillen correlation. However, the Gillen, the Gillen correlation is the one that's commonly used. Um, I think the reasons for this are one, this equation is a lot more simplistic, um, and also it's the one that's been used historically for a lot longer. So I think people are just more, in industry, people are just more used to using that style of equation. Okay? But it doesn't actually matter which one you use to calculate your actual number of stages compared to your actual reflux ratio, so long as you look at the boundaries of those equations and actually see that your distillation column is within the data that they actually looked at. Okay? Another one of these correlations based on collecting lots of experimental data for real life distillation columns in operation is the Kirkbride correlation. And what the Kirkbride correlation does is it allows you to estimate essentially the, the feed stage location within your distillation column. So it's actually the ratio between the number of stages in the rectifying section to the number of stages in the stripping section in your column. Okay? So it's purely based on correlating data and essentially what you, what you need to know is your bottom product flow rate, your distillate flow, and then the compositions of your light and heavy key in the feed and the composition of the light key in the bottom 
and the composition of the heavy key in the distillate. And that allows you to calculate this ratio between the number of rectifying stages to the number of stripping section stages. Okay? So, typically, when we've actually got this approximation for our distillation column, okay, this allows us to get an approximation, and it would allow us to get an approximate cost for our distillation column, so we can then make some decisions about whether we want to take this design of the distillation column forward to actually look at it in a rigorous design. So, what we typically do is we do these shortcut methods, to get an approximation for our column, and then we would move to a tool like HiSys or Pro2, an actual simulation tool, to actually do the full rigorous simulation of our distillation column. Okay? So as I say, not only can we use these then to make that initial decision of whether it's worthwhile to do that, but when you actually design a rigorous distillation column in HiSys, to get HiSys to actually converge onto the answer, you have to make a pretty good estimation first of the compositions within the column and the number of stages and the reflux ratio. So we need to take the values from this method first to actually be able to use HiSys. Okay? Okay, just before... Um, just before I move on with the, the next bit of the lecture, um, just to clear up a couple of uh, a couple of things that people thought for, for E1, if we've got our our distillation column, we've got our top and our bottom product. So if we want to calculate the average volatility. The average volatility is taken from the value at the top and the value at the bottom and then square rooted. Okay? So in question E1, the average volatility is already given to us. So this process has already been done. What we need to find is the relative average volatility. So the relative is if we've got two components, I and J, the relative is done by comparing I to J by dividing... Oh, I've done it off the sheet. The relative is done for I to J by dividing the I to the J. Okay? So don't get, so don't get confused between the average which is this process for the top and bottom with the square root, and relative, which is comparing one component to another component, which is divide. Okay? And the other comment that people have been saying, so question E2, always remember there's more information on the other side of the page. Okay? So... On the other side of the page is the Antoine equation for that system to allow you to find the saturated vapor pressure at given temperatures. Okay, so for the second part, I just want to move on to allow us to actually think about some of the key decisions that we should be making when we actually think about designing these multi-component distillation columns. Okay? So normally for our system that we have, our feed composition and our feed flow rate are fixed because they're just given to us as our feed. We can do very little about what we're actually given in terms of the composition and the flow rate for the feed. Again, our product specification are generally fairly fixed because our product specification is either defined by what we actually need as a sellable product or 
by what we actually need to allow our reaction to work. So we generally have that specification already. But when we've got our multi-component distillation, there are other parameters that we can actually think about changing. So one of the key parameters might be our operating pressure. Okay? So, yes, we can change our operating pressure. Okay? It's potentially expensive if we need to change it a lot. But there are advantages to potentially thinking about the operating pressure. The ideal case, if we could, would be that we set our operating pressure based on the temperature of our condenser. So ideally we want cooling water to be used in our condenser because cooling water is the cheapest cooling material apart from potentially air, but air is a very poor material for cooling. But cooling water is essentially the cheapest material for cooling. So if we want to define, if we, if we set the temperature in our condenser to be our ideal temperature, we would actually want to set it so that the condensing temperature is typically 10 degrees higher than the summer cooling water temperature. That would be our optimum if we could do that. Okay? And if we are using air, so I've got it here, if we, if we are thinking about air cooling and we can use air potentially, then because it's not as good as cooling, we would typically go to more about 20%, uh, 20 degrees above the summer air temperature. Okay? So when I say the, temp the condensing temperature, that actually depends on if we have a total condenser or a partial condenser. So if we're using a total condenser, the temperature that we're condensing to is actually the bubble point of our mixture. And if we're using a partial condenser, the temperature we're actually condensing to is the dew point of our mixture. Okay. So obviously that's the ideal, and we can do that, and we might think about that if we don't have to change the pressure a lot. But there are obviously some exceptions to this. Um, some exceptions are if we're looking at things like gases and light hydrocarbons. If we were trying to get the condensing temperature to around 10 degrees higher than the summer temperature of cooling water, so we're talking something like 35 degrees, that actually the pressure to do that is going to have to be really high because the natural boiling point of these gases and light hydrocarbons is a lot lower than that. So it would be too costly to try and get to that temperature. If we're looking at uh, distilling high molecular weight materials, then actually thinking about the, the temperature in our condenser may not be the optimum thing to do. If we're thinking about high molecular weight materials or temperature sensitive materials, we have to think about the maximum temperature in our system. The maximum temperature in our system is in the reboiler. Okay? So we've got to set the pressure thinking about what temperature we're actually going to take the material to in the reboiler. Because there's no point designing a wonderfully optimized column that saves you loads of money on the condenser at the top if when you turn it on, you get no product out because it all degrades in your reboiler. Okay? And the other exception is if we have a sequence of columns. So the next session we'll be looking at a sequence of columns. But if you have a sequence of columns, you might start to want to think about heat integration. Okay? And if you're thinking about heat integration for the whole system, it's actually then using cooling water is what we're trying to avoid doing and using heat integration. In heat integration, we're actually trying to use other streams within our, within our plant. Right? So therefore, we need to think about that temperature difference based on 
other streams within our plant. So actually, full process integration uh, is an incredibly complex system because we can actually look at adjusting things like pressures in distillation columns to actually allow you to do more heat integration. Okay? So with the operating pressure, I've got a little example here that shows how complicated it can be when we're actually thinking about savings due to changing the pressure. So we'll take for an example this benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene and styrene system. So we've got toluene to be our light key and ethyl benzene to be our heavy key. And in every case here we've defined this as a constant separation. So the amount of separation of the light and heavy key we do is set. So if we start to think about our pressure, so we go, okay, so we think maybe we should think about increasing our pressure. So we increase our pressure, and we find out that the relative volatility between the toluene and the ethyl benzene decreases. Well, that's not a good start, because the lower the relative volatility, the more difficult the separation. So not a great start. We also look, let's have a look at the minimum reflux ratio. We start to increase the pressure. Oh, the minimum reflux ratio goes up. Now we need to reflux more material through the system. That's going to cost us more money. Let's look at the minimum number of stages again. Oh, the number of stage, minimum number of stages goes up. So now, not only, you know, and these, and these two here are based on the fact that the relative volatility has decreased. So because the relative volatility has decreased, the separation is harder. It now means that we, one, need more reflux ratio, and we, two, need more stages to actually do our column. So our column is now recycling more material, and our column is now slightly bigger. Also, what happens when we increase the pressure is the temperature of our reboiler and the temperature of our condenser goes up. Okay? So potentially, because the reboiler temperature has gone up, this top line, we now actually need potentially more expensive heating material. Okay? So that also looks like a negative. But when we come to our last graph, when we actually increase the pressure, the, the, uh, the, the heat of vaporization for our system actually starts to decrease. So we've actually got a potential saving because now it doesn't actually take us as much energy to, to boil or condense our system. So now we need less utility. So even though we might be recycling more in our system, we're actually potentially making a saving because it's now easier to boil and condense our system. Okay? So you, it's just an example there to sort of make you think that when we're thinking about how operating pressure can affect our system, that it can be a complex mixture. Okay? So as I say, we, pick, we try and pick a temperature to get a condenser temperature, but actually one of the degrees of freedom is this condenser temperature or pressure, um, or reboiler temperature. So the optimum is to try and aim for cooling water, okay? But essentially if we need hotter material, it's more expensive, and if we need colder material, it's more expensive. Okay, so we want to try and use cooling water or low temperature steam or low temperature refrigeration if we can. So that's where we want to try and aim our column design to use those utilities because they're going to save us money. So one of our flexibilities we have is the choice of the reflux ratio. So our R min 
is obviously set based on our separation, as is our minimum number of stages. But we are free to pick the actual reflux ratio that we use. You should, have, you should be sort of familiar with these graphs from last year. No surprise that essentially as we increase the reflux ratio, the number of stages in our column decreases. And then based on this, we essentially have an operating cost, which is based on our energy in for heating and cooling. And we have a capital cost, which is based on actually having to build our distillation column. So as we increase our reflux ratio, our operating costs or our energy cost increase because we're now heating and cooling more material. But because the number of stages decreases, it then tends to be cheaper to build our distillation column because it's a smaller column. And hopefully, somewhere in the middle, if we combine them, is an optimum cost for a particular reflux ratio. Typically, we try and think about reflux ratios in the order of about 1 to 1 or 1.1 1, 1 .1 or 1.3 times the minimum reflux ratio that a lot of optimum reflux ratios forward in that region. However, in your handbook, you'll find a table with a large number of examples where that is not the case. Okay? So although people tend to think about this, and it might be worthwhile starting here as a first attempt, actually, in reality, you always need to think fully about this cost trade-off to actually get that optimum reflux ratio. And in fact, that optimum reflux ratio is different if you're using cooling water and steam to heat your column and cool your column than it is if you've got process integration and you're using process streams to heat and cool your column. Those optimum reflux ratios can be different. Okay. So although, as I said, that actually the feed flow rate and the feed composition are fixed, but we can think about the temperature and the pressure of the system. So we can actually change the feed condition. So that's our Q value. Okay? So to remind you that Q is the heat required to vaporize one mole of feed over the molar latent heat of vaporization of feed. So, in essence, if Q, equals zero, if Q equals 1, it's a saturated liquid feed, and if Q equals 0, it's a saturated vapor feed. So, generally, we prefer it if we've got a saturated liquid feed. The reason for this is that a liquid is much easier to control and pump than a gas. Right? So, liquids... You can use a pump. They tend to be incompressible. You can easily increase the pressure. Okay? Gases, you start to have to use things like compressors, but gases tend to be compressible fluids, and they can be quite difficult to actually pump through pipes. Right? And that's why you should be currently doing a course that includes compressible flow, right? because of how complex compressible flow is. Yep. So if we can... Let's have a liquid, because it's much easier to pump and transport a liquid. If we have columns with multiple feeds, which are possible, so we'll actually come on to thinking about columns with multiple feeds as we move through the course. If we've got columns with multiple feeds, it's not unusual to think about feeds with actually Q to be less than zero, so that's like a, uh, a superheated vapor, or streams where you've got greater than one. So that would be a subcooled liquid. Okay? And that's because you might be receiving these streams from other columns, and you need to change the pressure to actually pump them in to this column. Because if, if the column you're designing is operating at 10 bar, then you have to make sure that your feeds into that column 
are basically just a bit in excess of 10 bar, otherwise they won't enter that column. Okay? So the choice of the feed condition that we actually use can actually affect the, uh, essentially, the overall energy costs. So we can actually think about having a heater or a cooler on our feed inlet. Okay? That can actually affect how much energy we use in our system. So if you think about adding a hotter feed into the system, it's actually going to reduce your reboiler duty because now there's more energy being input at the feed, so you've got more energy in the system to allow vaporization. Okay? And that balance between the, the amount that you can put in at the feed and the amount that you can put in at the reboiler can actually then actually mean that you have a lower energy requirement overall in the system and a lower cost. And the best feed condition essentially can only be determined by actually looking at that heat recovery opportunities for your whole process. Okay? So a lot of these optimizations we're talking about, we need to actually think about the whole process. You know, um, 20 years ago, when we were optimizing systems, we only had the capacity to look at the optimization of maybe one or two units together because of the computational power needed. Right? Now we've got the computational power and the computational tools to actually start looking at global optimizations of whole chemical plants. So there's no reason not to look at all these heat integration options when we're actually designing our distillation columns. So another one of our um, options that we have is the, the feed stage location. So in the shortcut method, we had an equation to calculate the optimum feed or to give you an approximation for the optimum feed tray location. Okay? So the optimum feed tray location is actually very interesting because what this has to do with, it has to do with the equilibrium inside the column. So if you had a perfect, if you had a distillation column where you just allowed material in the column with different temperatures just to accumulate on the stages, you'd get a nice concentration profile through the distillation column. Where you input the feed, what you do is you actually locally, around that local equilibrium, you actually distort where the equilibrium should be in the column by adding our feed. The more change to that equilibrium you make, the more energy requirement you need to essentially get your column back to this ideal equilibrium. So what you really want to try and do is if you can put the feed in on a stage where it matches what's in the column the most in terms of composition, you essentially affect that equilibrium less. So this is an example here. So, so you can see we've essentially got the duty for our condenser and our reboiler based on the different feed tray locations. So if we take feed tray 10 as our example, we add our feed at feed, tra at feed stage 10, but actually you can see from these, these composition curves that they're still actually relatively smooth and smooth as they pass through that feed point as well. And that's because we've selected a nice optimal where our feed composition is quite close to what's actually happening in terms of that tray. If we have the same composition as feed, uh, same composition of feed, but we go, okay, well, let's go a couple of trays higher in our column. So just to tray eight, you can now start to see that these, these concentration profiles actually have sort of disruptions in. So here in this red, you can see there's a disruption caused by the fact that we've added the feed there and they're not as matched in, co in concentration. As I say, it costs us energy to actually recover that back to 
what the ideal situation. And we have the same if we go the other way and lower the feed tray. You can actually see we have these disruptions in our composition profile. So by getting a good feed tray location, you're actually saving yourself uh, energy on your condenser and reboiler. Okay? So that's actually very important to think about. And also, it's linked to the quality of the feed as well. So if you have a liquid feed and a vapor feed, there's no reason why the same tray might be the exact ideal tray. Okay? So the other options we've got are the type of condenser. So there's sort of two considerations that we have with our condenser type. So the first is what, what, uh, what phase do we want our product in? Is a liquid phase more useful for us? Or is a vapor phase more useful for us? Okay. And the other one is the energy requirement of it being a total condenser or a partial condenser. Obviously, with a total condenser, we condense everything. So that's bound to use more energy than a partial condenser, where we just condense some of our material. Okay? Also, because our total condenser is based on our bubble point, and our partial condenser is based on our dew point, they're at different temperatures. Okay? So if we think of our total condenser, one of our advantages of a total condenser is that we get a liquid product. And exactly the same as I said for the feed, a liquid product is great because we can pump it easily. If our next column is at a, is at a higher pressure, we can easily pressurize that material. Um, if we're sending our product for storage, a liquid takes up a lot less volume than a gas, so we have much, we have much smaller storage requirements. Okay? So a total condenser is great because it's a liquid, but if we think about a partial condenser, as I said, we're now condensing less material, so we reduce the condenser duty. So if we don't have those constraints about wanting that liquid, you know, maybe we could cope with the gas, because maybe we don't need to increase the pressure. Maybe it's not going straight to storage. So it doesn't matter at the moment. Also, because the partial condenser is only condensing to the dew point rather than the bubble point, the dew point is actually a higher temperature than the bubble point. So if you're close to requiring refrigeration, if you just need refrigeration to condense everything to the bubble point, maybe the dew point is actually high enough in temperature that you can get away with cooling water. So now you can use cheap cooling water instead of expensive refrigeration. Yep. So we need to think, we want to think about these options for our condenser. So there are some advantages of using a partial condenser to save us cost in terms of energy and cost in terms of cooling material above and beyond the advantage of having a liquid as our final product. Okay? So this session essentially had a quick reminder of vapor liquid equilibria and then we went through the shortcut method for multi-component distillation. So when you go through the shortcut method, you essentially follow those 12 steps that we outlined, okay, with the key shortcut equations. And then also when we're actually thinking about designing our distillation columns, we had about a thought about some of the key parameters that we need to think about when we're actually thinking about designing distillation columns. Okay? So that's really important to do and think, how can we save money? Because that's what everyone's interested in doing, is saving money. The advantage that comes with that is often you save money by reducing 
the amount of heating or cooling duty, which is also more sustainable. Okay? But it's often driven by money. <laughs>